flying north along the road from Lille to bust a German recon balloon. I wave to the footboys in their muddy trenches. Poor devils. Oh, how they envy me. Off to the left. Can it be? The scoundrel in the red fucker. My dear chum, Bates, signaled that his gun was jammed, but that greedy hun downed him nonetheless. The fucker is flying east, homeward. Low on petrol, no doubt. The balloon can wait. This won't take long. You are a hunter stalking Germany's most celebrated pilots, including the infamous Baron Manfred von Richthofen. Using news and intelligence reports, as well as your own intuition, you track down the 16 men whose successes diminish your own. In the gallant tradition of the ancient knights, you challenge each to determine who is truly World War I's Ace of Aces. A 100 page manual. Reference card. Technical supplement. Map of the Flanders God damn it, no. Let's fly. Originally released in the winter of 1990 for MS-DOS, I would guess in November or December. Developed and published by Microprose and designed by Jeff Briggs. Today, we are covering Knights of the Sky. Ports would be developed for the Commodore Amiga, the Atari STE, and the PC-98 in Japan. Today, we are covering the Amiga. Version. It was ported to the Amiga by the European division of Microprose, but it is still an NTSC origin game and is best played that way. But you don't have to take it from me, take it direct from Microprose, who included on the original disc a utility to stretch your PAL screens into NTSC 60Hz with a 4-3 aspect ratio. Here on the Amiga, it would appear to have been released a little less than a year after DOS in the fall winter of 1991, I would guess October or November. We'll start off per usual by taking a look at the manual. <laughs> a lot of stuff that came with this one. The young flyer walks out of the barracks. In its early dawn, the skies begin to lighten over Hunland. It will be another clear, cold day in Flanders. Looking across the deserted airfield, the breeze whispering his hair, it is almost possible to believe the Bosch are defeated and the war is over. But this is not so. Just yesterday evening, he almost met his maker when a German pilot suddenly appeared, as if out of nowhere. He was high and above the sleek and port fighter he was flying. In the nick of time, he had gone into a power dive that took him below the clouds. In that instant, he bowled into a half loop that brought the little biplane back above the cloud, face to face with the enemy. He pulled the trigger and watched as the German plane and the man at the controls were shattered and began spinning toward the ground ball of flames. No, the war is not over in the quiet, peaceful scene of the airfield with the gentle breeze is only an illusion of peace. You are flying for the Allies against the German Imperial Air Service and your career as a pilot begins in May of 1916. The war has been going on for 21 months and the fucker scourge is almost over. Your goal is to survive the remaining 30 months of the war and become the top scoring pilot. So Knights of the Sky is a World War I flight simulator and was released right in the thick of when a lot of companies were first targeting this era of flight. There had been the odd game which dated back to the early 80s. There was the Red Baron arcade cabinet from Atari. Flight Simulator 2 had an included World War I mini game. In 1990, there were four games released in quick succession, which were the first to treat the genre in a more serious manner. Wings from Cinemaware was the first, and although they were all released in 1990, it wouldn't surprise me if the rest were a reaction to that one. Blue Max from 360 was the next, probably the least well-known, which was followed by Knights of the Sky here, and finally the Red Baron from Dynamics slash CR, which seems to be the most famous of them all. Wings rightfully gets a lot of credit as well, although it's much more Amiga specific there because it was exclusive for many years. Microprose was in the self-proclaimed area of realistic flight. Really, they were more in the middle, a balance between arcade and simulation, which is where Knights of the Sky lies. It's got a realistic feel along with things to make it more fun for the player and a bit of an added cinematic flair to top it all off. We'll start our look at the magazines with some release information. Amazing Computing, December 1991. 
Microprose has five new games for the Amiga Knights of the Sky, 5995, a simulation of aerial combat and gallantry in World War I pits you against Germany's most celebrated pilots. Video Games and Computer Entertainment, July 1992. And despite these screenshots being of the TOS release, they are actually covering this on the Amiga, a non-Amiga specific magazine in America covering not a game which was released first on the Amiga, but a a port to the Amiga round of applause thank you because games are worth covering on multiple systems because sometimes they're better sometimes they're worse sometimes they're the same sometimes they're different it's always worth discussion Little more than flying machine guns, these aircraft were deceptively simple, and the only IFF system available were called eyeballs. No fire control computers, no radar, no heat seeking missiles, no afterburners, no, well, no anything, really. Previously, Amiga pilots longing for the early days of air combat had only Simware's brilliant wings and 360's well intentioned Blue Max to choose from now, in addition to Dynamics Red Baron, which is super. Or on the IBM, but substantially less so on the Amiga. There's Microprose's Knights of the Sky, which may just be the Amiga World War I flight simulator. Knights of the Sky sees the player's character advance through the ranks, become a feared and respected ace, and eventually retire at war's end. Jaunty piano rags accompany lavish information screens where pilots keep abreast of the latest news from the front and between missions. The effect is a seamless recreation of days gone by. Purists will scoff the tactical views, zooms, and auto landings. No auto landings here, but most gamers will revel in the excitement that World War I had to offer. But the most important element in Knights is speed. While not exactly smooth as silk, it's by far the best of the bunch. And even at the highest level of graphic detail, the frame rate remains quite respectable. Unlike those other World War I simulations, the missions begin and end on the ground. Pilots take off from a home base and, with any luck, return to it. Whether it's a routine patrol, recon escort fighter interception, or balloon busting, once in the air there's never a dull moment. Come to think of it, there aren't many dull moments on the ground either. Knights of the Sky continues Microprose's tradition of melding historical accuracy with stimulating gameplay. Tell yo chaps, Microprose, 180 Lakefront Drive, Hunt Valley, Maryland, Sound 7, Graphics 8, Playability 8, Overall 8. Review from Scott Wolf. And thank you again for being not only an American magazine which covered multiple systems, choosing to cover the Amiga version, but for being the only magazine in America, period, which covered this for the Amiga. Not Amazing Computing, not Amiga World, not Info, just video games and computer entertainment quickly becoming a new favorite of mine. So we're a pilot in the war to end all wars, and when we start the game, we are randomly assigned to one of many possible aerodromes located throughout the Western Front. You'll be stuck there until your promotion to captain, and you'll achieve that by successfully completing random missions. These can be one of several flight sim staples, such as the dreaded escorting mission, like you're seeing here. I successfully completed one of these, and that could have been a technicality, as I was forced to land before I had actually brought them home. This is a hard game even on the first level of difficulty. Before I was recording, I defaulted to level 3, where I died 3 out of 4 times. For about half of the game, I was at level 2, where I still died a lot, and then I again forced myself back to level 3 for the last half. So it's hard enough dealing with things solo, nearly impossible when you have to worry about someone else. You are given the option to reject missions, but, you know, I kept trying. Escorts, patrols, defense, strikes, and the seemingly always fun balloon busting. But notice where we're being sent in relation to our home base. We're based in Bayou. Apologies, though I am trying with the pronunciations. You will come to notice an unfortunate staleness to the randomness. Go to one of two or three different cities before you approach the balloon, which is located between one of two or three different cities. Think you'll reject an escorting mission so you don't have to deal with it? Well, the next two or three missions could also turn out to be escorting missions. Rather than adding endless value with randomness, it just winds up being more repetitious than it would have been if he had just scripted them all with love. It took me around 80 missions to win the game, and I had felt like I had played pretty much all of them within the first 15. 
I had selected a different pilot just to collect some extra footage, and on the very first mission, it had me bomb some German HQ buildings. 80 missions before that, that was the first time I had gotten that one. Randomness can backfire, and either the game needs a greater variety of those random missions, or it needs scripted missions, or perhaps less of either of those. It's not a problem unique to Knights of the Sky, but it is a problem nonetheless. From Compute, July of 1991. Go back to where air combat began, before radar missiles and shaft, when the air was as clear as the mission, and a flying machine was silk stretched over wood. And go back to trash journalism, where we review multiple games at once. I did a thousand words for you, editor, although somehow not more than 100 in-depth words about any single game. Please pay me more. Oh, and let's invoke the Wayback Machine. Sherman and Mr. Peabody, gotta get that word count up. Three companies coming up with the same answer to the question, what's next? Or rather, what's left? Or perhaps Cinemaware made a splash at CES and the rest of the companies were rushing to compete. Of course, Wings is not mentioned here because this reviewer is ignorant of the Amiga. The next to make it into the fray was Knights of the Sky by Microprose. As expected, this one lives up to the high standards of a Microprose simulation. With 20 planes and a realistic flight model, Knights of the Sky is much more complete and realistic than Blue Max. A well-designed flight training mode with multiple difficulty levels helped get the new player off to an easy start. It's literally just a free flight mode with the option of enemies. Of the three World War One Sims, this game has the best campaign option. Your goal is to become the top ace of the war, the ace of aces, and to do that, you've got to stay busy in the air. News reports between missions on how the other great aces are doing add continuity and purpose to your campaign. If another ace has a big lead on you, follow the news to find out where he is and go after him. Knights is not without its share of problems, however, most notable is the fact that a single shot can kill you or your enemy. Such a clamor was raised over this feature that Microprose has made an update available. And as the multiple bullet holes on my dash show, there is a damage model on the Amiga. Counting its graphics, attention to detail, historical accuracy, sound quality, and mission recorder, Red Baron comes out on the top of this three-way dogfight, but the upgraded version of Knights of the Sky may be the better choice for those interested in head-to-head -head modem play. Quote unquote review from Richard Sheffield. Now, I will not speak definitively on other games unless I play them completely through, but holding to that allows me to sense the BS from others. Do you think that guy won all three of those games? Perhaps if I completed the Red Baron, I would also think that it came out on top. I kind of wonder if Wings doesn't better them all in terms of an experience, but I haven't completed that one either, and it's long, but I have won Knights of the Sky. While there are faults here, most of which were in a lot of flight simulators, like going on forever with random pointless missions, what it does right in terms of the overall experience makes it clear to me that you're doing a disservice by comparing all of those games together. The reviewer got into other areas of the game, like training ace mode and modem play. The game is about the game, which is the World War I campaign mode. Everything else is just tacked on. You fly in the game so quarantine that and you have the so-called training mode. You fight German aces, so rip it out and apparently this is adding value. And while the modem play and direct hookup is noteworthy because not that many others were doing it, if you all of that stuff was there just to appeal to reviewers, gamers want to play games. Make the reviewers' life easier. Let them fight the aces so they don't have to play the game. Appeal to their niche interests. Hey Carl in the next cubicle. No modem head-to-head -head VCR replay. The campaign's the game is what you're paying money for. And the reviewer actually said the Knights of the Sky had the best campaign mode yet Red Baron is the one that comes out on top. Let's get into the flight mechanics, the feel of it all. This is a mix between your flight simulator 2, which is about as real as it's going to get for the time, and your arcade or your NES Top Gun. F-22 Interceptor on the Genesis. If you're used to those ones and you come here, you're going to be overwhelmed by the realism, but if you've played Flight Simulator 2, you could be laughing, and the Cessna in that game is comparable to the best World War I fighters. The faster you go, the higher you should go. You can't just stay level at 100% throttle. If you want to land, you have to go slower. You can't just point down because the plane will fight you the entire way and force you up. Now, to a degree, Knights of the Sky does factor this in. Largely, however, the realism is through 
tricks. You force the plane to slide a little to the left or right randomly. You know, your mind could take that as wind. Each of these planes handled differently from the others. Guns being mounted on the hood synchronized to the propeller, that feels differently than guns being mounted on the roof. There were times I reverted to older planes because the newer ones just felt worse or I couldn't get used to them. There's quite a bit of damage modeling. Your rudder or your elevators can be damaged a little bit or a lot. It's truly a rush to be behind enemy lines with your plane falling apart, hoping that you can make it over those trenches to land. The best quality of this game is that it shines in that middle ground. On the scale of arcade and sim, it lies slightly more towards sim, but plenty of arcade in there as well. Add in those cinematic elements, which I actually feel those could have been done better, but combined, everything forms a great experience. When you shut down your fifth enemy plane or balloon, you'll be known as an ace. This is good, but there are other aces in the war who continue to rack up high ace scores. To be truly great, you must outscore them all. Become the ace of aces. Some of the information screens will tell you about the exploits of enemy aces, where they were last seen, what plane they were flying, what color it was, and so on. By observing where an ace was seen and noting the positions of enemy aerodromes, you'll soon be able to determine where the enemy ace's home base is located. Included with the game is a large paper map of the world over which you fly. One of the main features pictured on the map is the trenches. The trenches divide the area into roughly two equal parts. At different times during the war, the trenches moved in response to ground offenses. These three trench configurations are pictured on the map and correspond to what you see as you fly the area in the game. When you play Knights of the Sky, keep the operational map handy because you'll need it, both for navigation and for hunting down enemy aces. And as you hear me in the background celebrating, this is the heart of the game. Things were starting to drag sooner rather than later due to the repetitious missions. But upon gaining the rank of captain, we get to choose where we want to base. Not only is this a past due change in scenery, which is a strength for this game, great scenery, it really should have been shuffling us base to base from the beginning. But now the hunt begins. It's a great, if unrealistic, concept. Imagine being a pilot and you get your fifth kill, and you know that on the other side, there is one person out there whose sole purpose in life is to track you and kill you. This was fun, and you need the map to track them down. You don't actually need it while you're flying, because pressing spacebar gives you a practical GPS in 1916. Could have done without that, but if it's there, I'm gonna use it. Listening to the gossip, piecing together where these aces are, which isn't always clear, and sometimes they move around. This reinvigorated me until I killed the Red Baron and realized there was a lot more to go. If there had been a story, fictional or based on reality, all they have is an occasional headline. This game is begging for dialogue. On the ground, it just doesn't go far enough. The AI for all the aces is different and challenging. Luther von Richthofen was actually much harder than his brother, but much like the standard missions, the ace chase, while enjoyable overall, goes on too long. Computer Gaming World, February 1991. From owner Russell Sype himself, if you feel the need, the need for speed, you'd better look elsewhere. Or if you feel the need for quality writing, let's plagiarize and then we'll talk about other games instead of the one we're actually reviewing. On the other hand, if you really want to experience what World War I combat felt like, you're going to want to take Knights of the Sky up for a spin. So now let's take a look at Red Baron, no, we mean Knights of the Sky. You see, Dynamics had acquired the trademark before Microprose could. How do you trademark a name like that? It was already used in an Atari game. Snoopy, look out for Ken Williams. The next six paragraphs are about one hit killing you, which is not how it is on the Amiga. The planes feel realistic. The flight dynamics and the sounds of the sputtering engines are constant reminders that these early aircraft were mere minnows when compared with the killer shark found in jet combat games. Like F-19 and F-15 too, graphics are polygon filled and nicely rendered. While many gamers do not care for polygon technology, the Micropro system allows for numerous external views of the airplane being calculated simultaneously. This means that you can get an aesthetically superior vantage point of the crash behavior from almost any angle at almost any time. Figuratively speaking, be prepared 
prepared for hours of boredom followed by seconds of sheer terror, let's make it clear that the game does a good job of simulating the fact that World War I pilots did not take off, jump immediately into combat, and then land. There is the sometimes tedious task of flying to the mission location. The tedium all but disappears when you fly in accelerated time, which I never felt I had to do. The game includes 20 different World War I aircraft and dozens of enemy pilots to fly against, the most awesome of course being the Red Baron himself, his brother actually. In spite of the tension you face in combat, you don't really face death that often, even when you die. You can elect to be resurrected. Death, where is thy sting? Our recommendation is that you bite the bullet and resolve to let dead pilots stay dead. Furious doesn't begin to describe the bullshit that would be. You know, I've said a lot of things about Scorpio, but at least she beat the games. If she had played a month's worth of gameplay only to die and have to start over, she wouldn't rest until this was listed as the worst game of all time. I'd say that counts as more evidence that Computer Gaming World reviewers, despite a mandate, were not completing the games. Examples are set from the top down, Russell. You wouldn't feel that way after 80 missions. I've only killed 250 people, but let's be realistic. Jeff Briggs has done a good job of making World War One air combat live and breathe for us. This game is a must for World War One fans and flight simulation fans. And as we see a metal flash by, it's another example of this being a good game that could have been so great. Give me some fireworks game, a celebration. We treat the Red Baron with such reverence. He was known to land at the crash sites of his victim, take a token, and then decorate his house with it. When does a hero become a serial killer? Perhaps at trinkets. There's 16 enemy aces, I killed 15 of them. My reward? A pretty lackluster end screen. And that's after what is personally one of my favorite intros of all time. How much space on the disc did you waste for copy protection art? It's not a complaint as much as it is disappointment. This could have been not just a great World War I flight simulation for the Amiga and DOS. It could have been one of the best games of all time. And it's not. It's still a personal favorite of mine, but I actually thought more of it before I beat it. There's no reward for a month's worth of gameplay. 80 missions. Medals are cool, but give me a little more. Although, you could certainly argue that there is a reward for playing the Amiga version over DOS. Knights of the Sky is a prime example of not just how to port a game right so another system gets a similar experience. No, it's how you show pride. Taking advantage of capabilities which could still be better than VGA DOS if you tried. Custom chips with animation and sound features working independently from the processor. I'd say the Amiga best, even the MT32 in sound and music. The notes clash heavily on DOS, and I didn't care for the MT32 or AdLib. 256 color VGA graphics, huh? I don't know. Looking a little better with 32 Amiga colors, if you ask me. Pretty much every complaint the magazines had about the game on DOS was corrected on the Amiga. Hours of boredom followed by seconds of terror, it's scaled differently on the Amiga. Takes three or four minutes to get to the front on the Amiga, about eight minutes on DOS. Both heavily scaled in real life, it would take you 20 minutes. There's more and better scenery on the Amiga. Mountains, vehicle, traffic, 3D trees, they're 2D on DOS. Cockpit damage sounds to indicate that you've been hit. Explosions, things just glow on DOS. But while the Amiga has objective improvements, the two feel so different that you should probably play them both. It's harder on the Amiga. Enemies spawn on both versions, but on the Amiga, they spawn above and behind you, and they go faster. On DOS, enemies could be a mile behind you for the entire mission. You're lucky to get two minutes of silence on the Amiga. There were certainly times I would have preferred a calmer feel. A lot of the art is different and thus subjective, but probably took more time on the Amiga. Certainly dig that honky tonk. A lot of DOS games in the early 90s, despite their VGA support, were probably designed on EGA. I feel that's the case here. CGA was supported well into the 90s. Worth noting that DOS could look 
a lot worse. Also coming out in Japan for the PC-98, here it seems to be a more polished version of the EGA graphics. And the final version was made not for the Atari ST, but rather exclusively the Atari STE, a later model which was Atari's answer to the Amiga. And although it kind of looks worse here, I saw a video on actual hardware via a CRT. There it was virtually identical to the Amiga in graphics, not the sound of course. And the speed was significantly slower. Here is how my footage would have looked on the Amiga if I didn't have new hardware. I now have dual monitors. The old monitor was a gateway CRT from the late 90s. Notice the obvious dithering where two colors are put next to each other to create a third color. On a composite monitor or television, it blends almost flawlessly. On occasion, you notice a shimmer, but it works. The television, A+, probably using it here on out. As I said, this is a hard game and beyond the difficulty levels where it's not exactly a cakewalk on easy. Regardless of what you've chosen, there is a rolling difficulty. The better you are, the harder it becomes, as well as the technical changes that come with different aircrafts where the Germans have the primary advantage for most of the war. There was a brief sweet spot of superior aircrafts, but then I increased the difficulty. So that was the end of that. So strategy, look around. Around. They will spawn oftentimes on your butt. They will catch up to you. And generally, you should just let them. There's a feel for when you can turn around to face them, but if you get caught in a dogfight, you're just going to be going round and round in circles. Don't forget about the objective. Sometimes they will lose interest. Play to their speed advantage. Slow down. Pull up. Oftentimes, they will overtake you. Use those wonderful external views. Who needs radar? The manual goes into various strategies, but I found them useless. Try doing a full loop. You will stall, although a three 360 can be achieved by going down. I read the manual through twice, enjoyed it, but didn't need it for a single thing. The one time I needed it was when I was sent to bomb a convoy. Well, I don't know what a convoy looks like. I look it up in the manual. Useless bird's eye. Top down view. This is a 3D game. Computer Gaming World, November of 91. Where 1990s top nominees in the simulation category were land-based vehicle simulations, 1991s reflect the roots of the genre, flight simulators. Perhaps the most attention in the category were focused on World War I air combat simulations. Of these, two titles emerged as outstanding products, Microprose's Knights of the Sky, which feature modem to modem play and incredible action from the Allied perspective, and Sierra Slash Dynamics Red Baron, which feature advanced graphics and the ability to fly a campaign from either side of the trenches. I hope there's story in that and not just 80 random missions played from either side. Red Baron is the simulation of the year. And while the American Amiga magazines did not review the game, there was an ad for Knights of the Sky in January of 92. And in December of that year, it would make another list as well. The 1992 Top 10. Number 3. Knights of the Sky take the feel of the dogfight mode from wings and spread over a whole flight sim. And you've got a stupid sounding acronym. Simply brilliant. Although not brilliant enough to review, apparently. Do you think the paradox you mentioned earlier about US software companies trimming their agenda for Amiga games might have something to do with you? I don't know, maybe not review two junk multimedia titles for the CDTV or the hundredth different hard drive you've covered. You think you could have made some room to review the third best game of the year? Oh, but it's not just that. July of 93. Nominated by the editor to be voted on by the people, apparently among the best Amiga games of all time, although it did not make that final list. Can't be bothered to review it, though. In fairness, we don't know if Microprose sent it to them, and you know they weren't going to pay for it. It was said that five Microprose games, including this one, were released at the same time, probably for Christmas sales. Maybe spread them out a little more. The game has now informed us that the Allies are on the move, so let's talk a little more about the world. You can waste some hours flying around. There's over 100 towns listed for the Feely map and more in-game. It's certainly heavily scale, but there's a lot. Should you reach an edge, your plane will appear as if it is stuck in the air. If you turn, you'll be fine, but it's a nice size world that unfortunately 
you're not going to see much of. Besides being stuck in one area until you reach Captain, even when you move around, you're never sent east of an enemy airbase. You're never sent west of yours. My biggest memory of this game from back in the day was admiring Brussels on the map, which you're never sent to, but challenging myself to reach it. I was awed by all the buildings. I recall landing, possibly because I ran out of fuel, but feeling accomplished. To Europe, see you Amiga, December 91. What will you change into tonight? The charm of this game is it's very low techness. Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. And that can be a lot more fun than launching a heat sinking missile at a distant target. This is a fly sim that requires very acute flying skills. It's jam packed with action. A must buy for flight sim fans. Mark Patterson, 88%, 35 pounds, 99 pence. We're now seeing some of the more interesting missions of the game. Striking an enemy aerodrome, which I was actually doing before I was ever assigned to just as targets of opportunity while I was hunting aces. I wonder, even though we're dealing with random missions, if there isn't a criteria for some of them. Here we're assigned to destroy a German convoy. I only got this mission a few times during the game, and in this case I had moved to this base because of a headline I had read mentioning that this was a current hotspot. In particular, these were fun because they're moving ground targets. They're on the road. Roads curve. You gotta get low and slow. The game needed more of these types of missions because it's always fun. And I was never told to bomb an HQ building during this campaign. More of these, less patrols, less escorting. And tell me if the picture of the convoy from the manual in any way prepares us for what we're looking for. Amiga Computing, March 92. Last year, the Amiga was once again Britain's best-selling home computer. More than 250,000 machines were sold. Meanwhile, CD TV sales were less than the firm had anticipated. Commodores say that it has an installed user base between 15 and 17,000. War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Distressing plagiarism. These reviewers cannot write. So, as you probably guessed after that dismal introduction, that you should be fired, because that's what I was guessing. Knights of the Sky is a World War I flight sim. Not only that, but it's one of the most playable and appealing flight sims I've ever played. It's graphically excellent. It's got great sound effects, but most of all, it's fun. Fun with a capital F. And while we're about it, it's got a capital U and N as well. Yes, it's fun. Fired. It's very, very difficult to sum up Knights of the Sky in only two pages. <laughs> this is the guy struggling almightily to fill a word count. Maybe it's the sheer joy of having a flight sim where you actually get to fly and fight intelligent enemies. It could well be the large droplets of storyline. You mean the single sentence headlines? It's probably just the fact that it's really good fun to chunder around the place and look at the sights. Add to this the best ever intro scene in the entire universe and you've got a winner. In a nutshell, Knights of the Sky is the most original, playable, and lovable flight sim I've ever played. Most pleasant indeed. Daniel, last name withheld. Good choice. And a 92%. Now this is what I'm talking about. Bombing the trenches. And despite the frame rate chugging a little in this area when overall it runs pretty good, more of this please. I only got it this one time. Actually when I was collecting DOS footage it was the first mission there. The front is barren for a reason. There's a war going on. Let's spend some time there. How about a night mission? Those were pretty rare, but the front was said to be quite bright at night. I don't care for the dawn and dusk flights because all the game does is decrease the brightness. The final year of the war was marked by long and bitter fighting both on the ground and in the air. The Imperial Air Service was on a long and steady decline, becoming less and less effective as the Allies continued to outproduce them. During the spring, German ground forces launched a series of offensives that looked as if they might just turn the war around. But in the air, the Allies continued to dominate overall, and the spring offenses became the Swan song of the German Air Forces. Introduction of new and improved aircraft such as the Fokker D7 could not hope to regain supremacy from the Camel Spats, Newports, and SE5s of the Allies. These new Fokkers did divert the end, but the end was inexorably marching closer. When the spring offenses exhausted themselves and the Americans entered the war with fresh troops and boundless morale, the ground fighting went hopelessly against the Germans. It was grim and deadly. 
casualties when viewed from a percentage basis were extremely high. Most pilots who gained fame from being the very best, the aces, are a curious reference point. By war's end, the number of dead ones far exceeded the survivors. What in 1914 had been recreation had become an art and a science. Rickety machines that were little more than kites with engines had become, through the crucible of battle, highly tuned specialty aircraft. The seeds of all future military air operations had been planted. Amiga Power, December 91. It's not just the feel of nice this right the look is there as well we're talking green fields and trees blue rivers and sea white cliffs blue mirage balloons and buildings in all shapes and colors the brightly colored planes help a lot too the only real problems are those which apply to any flight sim like flying with a digital joystick. This game does support analog sticks, although I actually preferred flying on my micro-switched Wiko. This game has that control in mind. It flies fine, although I preferred the actual dog fighting on DOS with my flight stick. It's got a lot of great graphics, see your pants flying, accessibility, and tinkly piano music. Take it from me, hedge clipping in a cricket biplane is considerably more fun than the detached business of flying a modern warplane. Jonathan Davies, 87%. The 100 best games ever from Amiga Power, which they did every year. May of 92. The ninth best game of all time. The people behind Flight Simulation should have Knights of the Sky nailed to their collective forehead as a constant reminder that flying should be a chortle, not a chore. Amiga Format, December of 91. Looking down on the muddy hell of some is a sobering thought. Europe is killing itself 5,000 feet below, and all that holds you aloft is a precarious plane made of nothing but plank and plywood. To add to the terror from the Red Baron is hunting down Allied pilots in the early morning clouds. Be afraid. Be very afraid. So, if you're keeping track, these reviewers have collectively referenced Sherman and Mr. Peabody, Top Gun, Edwin Starr's War, and now David Cronenberg's The Fly. I think whatever handbook these guys are reading on how to write reviews is the same one I've written for myself on what not to do. To say these connections are stretching it is being very kind, and none of them are funny. I do it too, but it's humor, parody, or a connection much deeper. And actually, if you take out that one line at the end, that would have been the best overall introduction. Excellent 3D and static graphics. Ram home the message. This is the Amiga biplane sim. It can be an absorbing and thrilling aviation history lesson, but you have to find the period and subject interesting. Learn to fly one of these babies, though, and you're guaranteed hours of testing dogfights to the death against some of flying's greatest heroes. Trenton Webb, 88%. Absorbing and thrilling aviation history lesson, yes. And not only does Nice at the Sky give you that, I find good games based in reality oftentimes have me digging deeper into the subject. In particular, with Microbros, I think I'm always doing that. I've been looking up a few aces of the war as a whole, flying particular planes, trench warfare, daytime versus nighttime. Been watching some French and German videos, so hopefully I might pronounce some names correctly. If you're of the type, a good game brings you knowledge. This is such a game. Well, it certainly could have used some more story, a better ending, and less repetitious missions. If we think of World War I and we think of 1991 with the Amiga and DOS, it's a pivotal title. It's a personal favorite, although on a critical level, disappointing because it's so close to transcending the test of time. But there's too many faults for that. Written reviews at shot 97 retroblogspotcom A special nod and thanks to Shaka. This had long been on the list to cover, but sometimes you need that push of excitement, and watching her play is what provided that. So I'd like to point you to her as well as my videos for FA18, Flight Simulator 2, and Wing Commander 2. Since Twitter is pretty lonely now, I figured why not be lonely together and start a Discord. There'll be a 30-day invite in the description and comments. Otherwise, let me know and I'll send you one. I'm on threads and whatever they're calling that other place now, at Shot97Retro. See you when I get to it. Discord to stay in touch. Goodbye.